I'm traveling, and I wake up suddenly in the silence before dawn in a strange hotel room, in a poor country where my language isn't spoken, and I'm shaking and shivering. Why? There's something, something's happening far away back in my own country. Yes, I remember. It's the execution. The newspaper article said this would be the hour, this was the date. I catch my breath. And so now they come. They come for the man who lies on his cot. The cat-like man whose face is so large, so black, that the guards who open his cell are once again frightened, shaken. The technicians wheel the gurney into the cell, and the man stands up and climbs onto the gurney and stares at the ceiling. And now they tie him down to the gurney with leather straps. His arms are strapped to special extensions which protrude from the gurney on either side. It's not a blood test, but the technicians try not to hurt him as they insert a catheter into the crook of his right arm, then proceed to the left. And now they wheel him into the chamber where witnesses watch through a glass wall, and the catheters are connected to long tubes through which the chemicals can flow. Does panic mount in the man's heart? Does he make an attempt to calm himself? The chemicals induce paralysis of the face, paralysis of the body. So none of us will see any sign at all of the agony of the man, not even a straining against the straps. Don't you feel, when you're traveling in a strange country and you wake up in the middle of the night, unexpectedly, when you wake up at an odd hour in a strange place, don't you feel frightened? I can't stop shivering. Uh, the lamp by my bed doesn't work. The electric lights won't turn on. The rebels have blown up the electricity towers. There's a small war going on in this poor country where my language isn't spoken. The hotel has thoughtfully placed a candle in a little candle holder on a table by the bed. I get up, light the candle, carry the candle into the bathroom. Then I put the candle in its holder on the floor, and I kneel down in front of the toilet and I vomit. Then I'm sitting shivering on the bathroom floor. This cold square of tile on a hot night in a hot country, and I can't stand up to go back to bed. So I sit there quietly, shaking as if I were sitting in the snow. And in the corner of the bathroom, brown against the tile, there's an insect, big like a water bug. It's flat, heavy, very tough legs. They look like metal. And it's waiting, squatting, deciding which way to move. And in a second, it's crossed behind the sink and it's trying to fit itself into a hole too small for it to fit in. But it fits in, it fits, it's gone. And I see myself. I see myself, a moment of insight. It's the birthday party in the fancy restaurant. Yes, there's a table with its sweet and pretty decorations, the fanciful centerpiece pink and green, and there are all the women in bright red lipstick, the men in beautiful shirts, and all the gifts, outrageous, unexpected, funny gifts. And there are the waiters serving the salmon and pouring the wine, and there I am. I'm talking quietly with that small, pale woman in the red and blue dress about the love affair with the older man, the criminals, the psychiatrists the film that disturbed her and the actress, the walks at night through the woods and the country, the insatiable appetite for violent sex, the suffering of the people living in desperation in the crowded shelter across the street from the fancy restaurant. And as I sat there talking with a woman in the red and blue dress, I thought I was a person who was thinking about a party. What so many complicated feelings about it. Who liked some aspects of the party, but not others. Who liked some of the people there, but not all of them. We like that fancy pink and green centerpiece, but didn't really care for the red and blue dress. But no, no, I see it so clearly. I see myself with my little fork. I wasn't a person who was thinking about a party. I was a person who was at a party, who sat at the table, drank the wine, ate the fish. We didn't talk about the fish. We didn't talk about the restaurant. We talked about the lakes and the mountains in the north of Thailand, the crowded shelter across the street. 
But where were we? Where were we? Not by the lakes, not in the shelter. We were there, just there, at that table, in that restaurant. Well, maybe for certain people. Maybe for certain people who lived in Vienna at the time of Freud. What was hidden and unconscious was the inner life. Maybe the only thing those people could see was the outward circumstance, where they were, what they did. And they had no idea at all of what was inside them. But something's been hidden from me too. Something. A part of myself has been hidden from me, and I think it's a part that's there on the surface. What anyone in the world could see about me if they saw me out the window of a passing train. Because I know quite a bit about what's inside me. I've been a student of my own feelings since I was nine years old. My feelings, my thoughts. The incredible history of my feelings and thoughts could fill up a dozen leather-bound books. But the story of my life, my behavior, my actions, that's a slim little paperback, and I've never read it. <laughs> I never wanted to. I thought it would be terribly boring. What would be in it? Chapter one, my childhood. I was born, I cried. Chapter two, all the rest. I maintained myself. I got up, I went to work, I went home, I went to bed. I went to a restaurant, I ate fish. Who cares? For God's sake. Did I have to travel to a poor country where no books are printed in my own language? Did I have to be cast down on a, on a, bathroom, floor in a, in a, in a bathroom floor in a strange hotel where no books are printed in my own language in order to be forced to finally open that dull volume, the story of my life? And I vomit again. Dear God, no. I'm not going to read it. I won't read it. My parents loved me. They raised me to think about people, the world, humanity, beauty. Not to think about restaurants and fish. I was born into the mind, lamplight, the warm living room. My father in an armchair reading about China. My mother with a newspaper on a long sofa. Orange juice on a table and a glass pitcher. And they read me a book about all the people in so many different uniforms who came to our home to help our family. Coming from every corner of our beautiful city. The delivery man from the grocery store, the mailman with the mail, all so kind. And down the street, the old woman who worked in the bakery bent down and gave me sugar-covered buns. And dear God, I always knew that life was precious. I always thought life should be celebrated. Today, in the capital city of this poor country, I went to an office, a quiet office, a few ancient computers, cabinets, and chairs. And it was a somewhat secret office. And the job of this office was to make a record of all the cases of political murder and torture and rape. I talked to a quiet man who worked in the office. In this particular poor country, he explained to me, the government paid torturers and killers to murder certain citizens and then to leave their bodies in the streets as examples or carry them off to the countryside. And the victims were students or farmers or factory workers, rebels perhaps, or guerrilla fighters from the slums or from the mountains. And the quiet man showed me photographs on the walls of the bleeding corpses of some of his friends. One was a school teacher killed near a school. And there were black and white snapshots of shyly smiling women and men at some time before their deaths and these were pinned up next to the pictures of their corpses. And some of the pictures were radiant with goodness. And I thought of the delicacy with which my parents taught me to urinate into the toilet, to be careful around toilet seats, to wash my hands always with soap, to avoid people with the flu with colds, to avoid rooms that were drafty, to avoid rooms that were cold and wet. And how they taught me to love traveling, the wonderful train trips, the magic of riding along at night in our little compartment. And I remember that as I brushed my teeth on the moving train, I could see through the window the dark farmland as it raced past. And here, from my spot on the bathroom floor, I can see through the window, gorgeous in the moonlight, the gorgeous mountains of the poor country, soaked with the blood of the in innocent, soaked with the blood of those shy, shy faces, battered, shy faces walking through a garden with my mother, enormous roses, and through a dark pine forest, my father pointing to a yellow bird. Sadie. 
You see, I like Beethoven. I like to hear the bow of the violin cut into the string. I like to go out at night in a cosmopolitan city and sit in a dark auditorium watching dancers fly into each other's arms. Yes, let's admit that certain people, even people whose faces perhaps are radiant with goodness, let's admit that certain people are being awakened suddenly at night by groups of armed men and dragged out into a stinking van with black windows and a carpet on the floor and stomped by boots until the lips are swollen like oranges streaming with blood. Well, yes, I was alive when those things were done. I lived in the town whose streets ran with the blood of good-hearted victims. I wore the clothes which were pulled from the victims, of the, the, the bodies of the victims when they were raped or killed. But I still love the violin, love the music, the dancers, everything I touch, everything I see, the city with its lights, the theaters, the coffee shops, the newsstands, the books, the constant celebration. Life should be celebrated. Life is a gift. And I can't stand the way people say, when I was a child, I loved elephants. When I was a child, I loved balloons. Are they trying to say if they stopped and looked at a balloon today or at an elephant today, they would not love them? Why wouldn't they love them? I think we still love what we always loved. How could we not? And one of the things I always loved, I wonder if you did, was a wonderful way that different small objects the Christmas presents and birthday presents that adults always gave to each other were wrapped, were packed. To say the present was a small china cup or plate or a tiny china vase. Well, first, there'd be a brown cardboard box from the shop that looked like it ought to have a rocking horse or a tricycle inside because it was just so big. Except that if you lifted it, it was always incredibly, miraculously light. <clears throat> And you would always imagine that this big brown box had been packed up and sealed up by some sort of huge and muscly industrial type workers who were completely indifferent to the contents of the box. And then someone would make a cut with a knife in the brown tape at the top of the box. And inside that box, you'd find another box wrapped in thick, shiny paper and tied with some brightly colored, thick, shiny ribbon. And you would naturally imagine that this inside box had been wrapped by some very refined and modest looking lady whose hands were softened with sweet smelling cream, who very definitely cared a great deal about whatever it was that was inside the box. And when the paper and the ribbon were undone and removed and the box itself, with its smooth surface like clear milk was finally revealed, someone would take off the top of the box and you would hear at that moment a little rustling or nestling sound like the sound of a hamster moving in its cage. And that would be the sound of all those tiny little pieces of squunched up paper that filled the box, giving a sort of quiet little sigh as the taking off of the top of the box gave them some sudden extra breathing space. And then the most exciting part of the opening would start, which would be the attempt to find out what in particular was inside the box. Aside from all those tiny little pieces of squunched up paper, if in fact there was anything else inside there at all, because at first you always thought, well, really, this time there is nothing else. So then someone, maybe you, would plunge their hand down deep in the box as if they were a diver searching for a pearl. And eventually they come upon something hard, something tightly wrapped in a different sort of paper. And when that last bit of wrapping was finally undone, there would be the cup or plate or tiny little vase just suitable for one little flower. And maybe if you'd seen a cup or plate or vase just sitting on a shelf in a shop somewhere, you might have thought it was nothing in particular. Or maybe if you'd seen it lying in a pile with heaps of others like it in the corner of some dark, dusty place that sold odds and ends. You would have thought it was an old piece of junk. But by the time it had been pulled out of all that paper, out of that milk-white box, out of that cardboard carton, it seemed like the most shining, sparkling thing in the world. And how delicate it seemed. How breakable and precious. You were right. It was. And my friends and I were the delicate, precious, breakable children. And we always knew it. We knew it because of the way we were wrapped. Because of the soft underwear laid out on our bed. Soft socks to protect our feet. And I can remember that my darling mother, my beautiful mother, my innocent mother, would say to me and my friends when we were nine or ten, now be very careful, 
Don't go near First Avenue. That's a bad neighborhood. There are tough kids there. Well, we had no idea what that meant. We thought that certain kids were tough. Maybe they just liked to be. And they lived in certain neighborhoods. Maybe because their friends were there. In the part of town where we lived, nice people had gathered together. It formed a community, and it was a good neighborhood. On First Avenue and other avenues, there were bad neighborhoods where tough people had gathered together. And those were the neighborhoods we had to avoid. We still avoid them. All of my friends, bad neighborhoods. The people who live in places like that would hurt you if they could. All the ones who would hurt you collect in those neighborhoods like water and drains, and it's terrible. It's awful. Why should people want to hurt each other? I always say to my friends, we should be glad to be alive. We should celebrate life. We should understand that life is wonderful. I'm feeling terribly dizzy, and I lean my head on the bathroom floor. In my own country, I've always loved staying in hotels. In fact, one of the things I think I like best is to sleep in a hotel in clean white sheets in some city I don't know. And then to get up early while the birds are singing and call room service and get them to send me up a big pot of coffee. And then to lie in bed and call up friends on the telephone while I sip my coffee. I could spend literally hours like that. Just talking on the telephone and laughing and drinking more coffee, watching the sun coming in the window, moving around the room. Then I'd get up and go about my day. But staying in a hotel in a foreign country is always different. About a year ago, I spent the day with a group of people I didn't know that well. We went to a nude beach, lying out there naked in the sun. There was a man who kept talking about the ruling class, the elite, the rich, all day long. The rich are pigs. They're all pigs. Someday those pigs will get what they deserve, and things like that. He was a thin man with a large mustache, unhealthy looking, but very handsome, a chain smoker. As he talked, he would laugh, sort of bitter barks that came out always unexpectedly. I'd heard about these words and these phrases all my life, but I'd never met anyone who actually used them. I thought it was quite entertaining. But for about a month afterward, a strange thing happened. Everywhere I went, I started getting into conversations with people I met on a train, on a bus, at a party, in the line for the movies. And half the people I met seemed to be talking like him. The rich are pigs. Their day will come. They're all pigs, and on and on. I started to think I was going crazy. I thought I was insane. Could this really be happening? Was communism suddenly coming back into style? One day, there was an anonymous present sitting on my doorstep. Volume one of Cop Das Kapital, Kapital by Karl Marx in a brown paper bag. Did someone leave it as a joke? Did someone seriously think I should read it? And who had left it there? I never found out. Late that night, naked in bed, I leafed through it. At first, it seemed impossible. A sort of impenetrable dangle of obsessively repeated groups of words curling around each other like moles underground. But when I came to the part about the lives of the workers, the coal miners, the child laborers, I could feel myself suddenly breathing more slowly. How angry he was, page after page. Then I turned back to an earlier section, and I came to a phrase that I'd heard before, a strange, upsetting, sort of ugly phrase. This was a section on commodity fetishism, the fetishism of commodities. And I wanted to understand that weird sounding phrase, but I could tell that to understand it, your whole life would probably have to change. Marx's explanation of the phrase was very elusive. He used the example that people say 20 yards of linen are worth two pounds. People say about everything that it has a certain value. This is worth that. This coat, this sweater, this cup of coffee. Each thing worth some quantity of money or some number of other things. One coat worth three sweaters or so much money. As if the coat, suddenly appearing on the earth, contained 
somewhere inside itself an amount of value, like an inner soul, as if the coat were a fetish, a physical object that contains a living spirit. But what really determines the, the value of a coat? What is it that determines the price of a coat? The price of a coat comes from its history. The history of all the people who were involved in making it and selling it, and all the particular relationships they had. And if we buy the coat, we too form relationships with all those people. And yet we hide those relationships from our awareness by pretending we live in a world where coats have no history, but just fall down from heaven with prices marked inside. I like this coat, we say. It's not expensive. As if that were a fact about the coat, and not the end of a story of all the people who made it and sold it. I like the pictures in this magazine. A naked woman leans over a fence. A man buys a magazine and stares at her picture. The destinies of these two are linked. The man has paid the woman to take off her clothes. The photograph contains its history. The moment the woman leaned over the fence. The photographer, the publisher, who commanded, who obeyed. The cup of coffee contains a history of the peasants who picked the beans. Now some of them fainted in the heat of the sun. Some were beaten, some were kicked. For two days, I could see the fetishism of commodities all around me. It was a strange feeling. Then on the third day, I lost it and was gone. But not long after the gift of the book, I was waiting for a bus. Someone with a very nice smile was standing behind me, their thin chest covered by a faded t-shirt. And written on the t-shirt was a single word. It was the name of a poor country where a group of rebels had taken over and made a revolution. The bus was delayed. It got later and later. And I finally smiled at the smile that was standing behind me. And I asked the person, have you been to that country, the one on your shirt? And the person said, yes. Have you been there too? A flush of warmth coming into their face. Well, then a bus pulled up. The person got on, but it wasn't my bus. About six months later, I'd been to a party in an elegant part of town, and I had a lot to drink. After the party, I'd walked around for a while. It was a dark night. The streets were wet. I was racing along by some blue trees, and suddenly I saw a pool of light. And in the center of the light, a walnut-faced man with gray hair and a dusky suit was hailing a taxi. He'd been at the party, although we hadn't spoken. He asked if I was going his way, and I was. His accent was musical. We got in the taxi. His hands were shaky with an odd tremor, and his voice was like a thick, dark syrup. He was speaking in these very condensed and ironic phrases. And after a while, I awkwardly said, I can't place your accent. Where are you from? He looked at me darkly. And with particular irony, he revealed that he came from the poor country where that revolution had occurred the country whose name I'd seen on the t-shirt months before. He worked for that revolutionary country as a diplomat. Is it difficult to travel to your country, I asked. He explained mildly that you could get yourself there rather easily by taking a couple of ordinary airplane flights. About a month later, I had a few free weeks, and I decided to take a trip to that revolutionary country. It wasn't at all like what it expected. There were lots of soldiers, that was a fact. But to me, they looked more like shepherds and Renaissance paintings. Their green uniforms looked like pajamas. I was very refreshed. I talked to people in the government who got to work at their offices at dawn. They were very tired, but very polite, gentle, humorous. Some were very warm, some seemed wistful. They were building schools and small villages, opening clinics. One day, I stopped in a public square and wrote in my notebook the romantic sentence, these shy smiles are like a garden for me. I stayed in an eccentric, expensive hotel, and the ice cream there seemed to me like a drug. It was so light, delicious, perfect. A journalist I met who was staying at the hotel explained to me that it didn't make sense to admire a revolution because of its ice cream. <laughs> but in a sense, he missed the point. The ice cream was charming. I was happy there, but I decided to spend some of the time I had left in some other poor countries, which were quite nearby, 
but where no revolutions had taken place. And so I went to some poor countries whose names I felt would never be happily worn on any t-shirt at all, where the soldiers had frightening expressions on their faces, where wealthy families sat in glittering restaurants eating plate after plate of multicolored ice cream. But when I tasted the ice cream, every flavor tasted the same, and none were delicious. I grew weak hearing descriptions of electrical torture, the condition of bodies. I saw orchards of unsurpassed beauty where women who picked fruit had been raped and then strung up and hanged from the trees. But one bright sunny morning, I met a teacher who spoke to me in my own language. And he took me to a little hut crowded with gaunt faces where there was joyful singing. And an old man spoke passionately about love, forgiveness, the importance of tolerance and mercy. And one afternoon in a dark cafe, I drank some cups of tea with an armed guerrilla fighter, a young woman in a bright yellow shirt. It was a little bit scary. Her skin was covered with scratches. Her eyes were too bright. She seemed to be on fire with a painful illness. She couldn't be described as a follower of Marx, but she'd read some of his writing when she was a student. And she pointed out that unlike other philosophers and educated people, Marx had made a very strange gesture of throwing his life at the feet of the poor. In other words, Marx was a follower of theirs. He was on their side. I kept trying to get her to talk about herself. She hadn't seen the village where she was born for a very long time. She loved her parents. She had two small children. Her husband had died in his early 20s. Clenching and unclenching her hands, she spoke feverishly about a sister who'd been killed by government thugs. Her sister's head had been mutilated. After her sister's death, she'd left everything behind and walked into the mountains to find the rebels. She learned to go out without eating for days. The poise, the dignity of a wild animal. I went home and I resumed my regular life. But I couldn't help noticing that something awful was happening to me. At first, I tried to ignore it or dismiss it, like some symptom you hope will go away by itself, but it didn't go away. One was that it was happening. I always said, I'm a happy person. I love life. But now there was a sort of awful indifference or blankness that was coming from somewhere inside me and filling me up bit by bit. Things that once would have pleased me or even delighted me seemed to go dead on me to spoil. I went to see some people I knew, close friends. I'd never visited their home before, and we'd all been looking forward to my visit for years. This is our bedroom, opening a door. The baby sleeps here. Each room was beautiful. Each had a simple tastefulness. There were striking touches. There were lovely objects from around the world. The children's room had blue sky wallpaper, even on the ceiling, shelves with big yellow chickens and ducks. But I felt wrong. I felt nothing, a numbness. I went to a play with a group of friends, a legendary actress in a great role. We stared at the stage. Moment after moment, the character's downfall crept closer. Her childhood home would at last be sold, her beloved cherry trees chopped down. Under the bright lights, the actress showed anger, bravado. The stage rang with her youthful laughter, which expressed self-deception. The woman she played would soon be forced to live in an apartment in Paris, no longer on the estate she'd formerly owned. A man whose father had once worked there as a serf would now buy the estate. It was her old brother's sympathetic grief that finally coaxed tears from the large man in the heavy coat who sat beside me. But my problem was that somehow, suddenly, I was not myself. I was disconcerted. What, why exactly were we supposed to be weeping? This person would no longer own the estate she'd once owned. She would live in an apartment instead. I couldn't remember why I was supposed to be weeping. Riding in a taxi home from the play, my friends were critical of one of the actors. His performance had been slack, inadequate, not thought through. If the character he played behaved in such a fashion in the first act, his later actions could not be explained. But I stared frozen out the taxi window. Sometimes I was fine. I remember one morning, a marvelous blue sky. I had my hair cut. Gentle hands molded my hair so it fit over the shape of my scalp like a cap. 
Then I bought myself a pair of comfortable socks. And then I looked at them carefully. And I bought myself two more pairs. Because it's not easy to find the kind of socks I like. <laughs> but then I got into a taxi. And as I was riding across the city, it was as if that feeling of indifference had become a sort of physical illness. My stomach was beating. It was just like a heart. A cold sweat on my forehead and neck. I wasn't me. Someone with whom I'd had a very happy love affair years before was there to meet me. We smiled, we embraced. But I wasn't there to be embraced. The person I was hugging felt like a, a doll electrically warmed. I myself was a funny smelling doll. In the old apartment, full of memories, we talked about a recent play, a film, a terrible performance by a group of dancers, one of whom we knew. And I heard about the dinner with our friend Nadia, who was working on a painting but was also doing graphic design, and the story of the wooden figure smuggled out of Mexico wrapped in clothes. Our funny friend Petrus had been mugged on the street. Amazingly, the police had caught the thief as he was running around the corner. Petrus had said the man's criminal record was as long as that biography of Henry James. The adventures of Petrus and the police and the courts were a hilarious comedy, Petrus being Petrus. But as I listened to the story, I remember that a friend of my mother's had once said to me, I like you because you have such a nice, loud, merry laugh. And I noticed that my laugh was like a tight little cough. We're going to have dinner with another friend of ours in a hotel dining room near the office where he worked. But when we met our friend, we wandered by mistake into the hotel ballroom. There were prosperous looking executives, probably retired, dancing with their wives to awful music. Men with baggy pants and big thighs and coins in their pockets. And their wives were wearing flowery dresses with their hair like wigs. And our friend said, God, how unhappy they are. How painful it is. How sad life is. But I stared at those executives in their dark suits and I felt only that numbness. It was even in my mouth, on my tongue. A sort of sour lovelessness. A sort of horrible, rotting lovelessness. And toward the end of dinner, our friend finally told us that his father had died. He described the hospital, the doctors, the machines. It was as if he felt that no one had ever died before. As if he felt it was quite unfair that his father should have died. Yet no expense had been spared to extend his father's life for as long as possible, to make sure that his death was as comfortable as possible. Hardworking experts surrounded his bed, doing all they could to see that he would die without feeling pain. I couldn't help mentioning those others who died every day on the torture table, screaming, carved up with knives, surrounded on their bed of death by other experts who were doing all they could to make sure the ones they surrounded would die in howling agony, unimaginable agony. My remarks were out of place. Where was the sympathy I owed my friend? I, his loss was real. He looked at me appalled. By then, it was Christmas. A festive atmosphere filled the streets and shops. And one night, I had a dream. And I dreamed it was Christmas. And I had a wonderful family with two or three young children. And in the dream, I woke up suddenly, frightened and sweating. And I went into the bathroom to brush my teeth. My toothbrush, paste, and water glass were crowded as usual onto a shelf. And as I glanced into the bathroom mirror for a moment, the shelf on which these things rested started to tilt. The water glass slid slowly along it, then fell and broke on the tile into thick, sharp pieces. I lost my balance, slipped, and stepped directly onto a shard of glass. Blood filled the floor. My family came. I was crying, sobbing. I'm sorry, I said. I can't give you any more presents. I love you all, but I don't want to give you any more presents. The words came flying out of my mouth. I didn't know why I was saying them. I'd always wanted my children to be happy. I always wanted them to have the best of everything. Then I woke up and I thought about the dream, the presents. I thought about Christmas, the streets, the shops. Was that why people brought children into the world? So that they too could one day roam, grow up, roam through the streets, buying, devouring, always the best? The best food, the best clothes, the best everything? So that they too could one day demand the best? Were there not enough people in the world already who demanded the best, who insisted on the best? No. We must bring in more of these people. We must bring in children. 
And then we should gather together more treasures from all over the world, more of the best for all these new children of ours to have. Because our children should have the best. It would be our shame, our disgrace to give them less than the best. We will stop at nothing to give them the best. I was in a very bad state. And it wasn't that I particularly loved the trip I'd just taken, but I felt that maybe I should go back again. Go back again to more poor countries, and maybe that was the thing I should do to cure my feeling of sickness or restlessness or whatever it was. I even had a suitcase that was not yet unpacked, and so I thought, well, maybe. And I was on my way. My last night in my own country, I spent in an airport hotel. The people in the room above mine were playing music much too late. I called the front desk and complained. As I lay in bed, I imagined the people above me who were listening to the music. They were dressed in comfortable, informal clothes, I thought. They were free, happy, maybe a little bit drunk or high. Maybe they were dancing. I'd always been so fond of the song they were playing, a beautiful song. And I felt a sort of exquisite pleasure, lying against my pillow, listening to the song, waiting for the moment when someone would knock on the door of the room above mine, and the music would suddenly stop in mid-phrase. I'm freezing cold on the bathroom floor. I want to get back to my bedroom. I get onto my knees, but I can't stand up. There's a bath mat near me on the floor, and I slide it beneath me. Do you know, there are nights in the city where I grew up, the city that I love most of all, when it's too cold to rain, but the sky can't snow yet, although you feel it would like to. And so instead, it seems that at a certain moment, every car and face and pane of glass is suddenly covered by a delicious wetness, like the wetness you see on a frozen cherry. And on nights like that, when you walk through the streets of the nice parts of town, you see all the men in overcoats that hang straight down to the ground, staring harshly with open mouth desire at the fox-headed women whose lipstick ripples, whose earrings ripple as they step through the uneven light and darkness of the sidewalk. And that is the sort of thing that the communists will never understand. That is the sort of thing that the communists will never understand. Just as human decency is the sort of thing that I will never understand. Huh. Look, here's a question I'd like to ask you. Have you ever had any friends who were poor? See, that's an idea I think a lot of people have. Why shouldn't I have some friends who are poor? I pictured it so often, like a dream that comes back again and again. There have been so many people, people who work at menial jobs, who I've seen every day. People have caught my eye, talked to me, and I thought, how nice. It's nice. But then I always picture that they invite you to come over to their home for dinner. And I don't know what it is. It's something about the light bulbs. The flooring is coming up just a tiny little bit from the floor. You walk in and you say to yourself, it's fine. This is fine. It's all just fine. But you know it isn't. And there's a sort of sticky smell coming from somewhere, from a hallway or a room. And the television is on. And the walls are painted with a kind of shiny pink color. And there are children who are coughing and sneezing and wheezing. And there are some hard chairs. And you end up sitting on the floor. And you're squirming around on the floor trying to find some support. You're trying to find some support from your back. And they give you some food. And the meat is greasy. And the piece of meat seems to get bigger and bigger as it sits on your plate. And everyone has been incredibly nice. And somebody changes a baby's diaper. And then a week later, they call and invite you again. And you don't know what to say, so you go once again. And then once again, maybe a few months later. And then, I don't know, maybe by then you move to another part of town. Maybe they have. But the next time you meet is a year later, and there is never a time after that. Dear God, what's happening to me? I feel like there's nothing left of me. I feel like I don't think anything. I don't remember. What are the things I always say? I believe that there are. I believe, now, now stop that. Every person is a person. Every person believes certain things. But 
My friend Bob believes that democracy is the worst form of government, except for all the others. And Fred, Fred believes that today's rebel is tomorrow's dictator. And Natasha believes that peasants in poor countries just want to be left alone, to farm their fields in peace and quiet, and they couldn't care less about the ideologies of the right or the left. And Mario believes that social criticism in plays and films can be expressed most effectively through the use of humor. And Indrani believes that works of art, including performances of opera and ballet, can change individuals and through them society. And Toshiko believes that the only real contribution that people can make towards solving the problems of the world is to raise their own film families with good values. And Anne Marie believes that the rich and the poor should live as friends and should work together to make the future better than the past. But the question, the question is, would it really matter if it were Fred rather than Bob? who believe that democracy is the worst form of government except for all the others? What if Fred were to wake up one morning and think he believed that, forgetting that that was actually the belief of his friend Bob? Fred believes certain things. You can say that. But what does it mean? Does it mean something? I don't remember. In my beliefs? Yes. Yes, I have beliefs. Yes, I believe in humanity, sympathy for others. I oppose cruelty and violence. What? You applaud cruelty and violence? No, I said I oppose cruelty and violence. Jesus Christ, oppose, oppose. <laughs> I can still remember what I like, can't I? If not what I believe, I know what I like. I like warmth, coziness, pleasure, love, presence, mail. Nice plates, those paintings by Matisse. Yes, I'm an esthete. I like beauty. Yes, poor countries are beautiful. Poor people are beautiful. It's a wonderful feeling to have money in a country where most people are poor, to ride in a taxi through horrible slums. Yes, a beggar can be beautiful. A beggar can have beautiful lips, beautiful eyes. To you, her simple shawl seems elegant. You see her approaching from a great distance. She's old, thin. Mm, yes. She looks sick, very sick, near death. But her face is beautiful, it's seductive, luminous. You like her, you're drawn to her. Yes, you think. There's money in your purse, you'll give her some of it. And a voice says, why not give her all, all of it? Why not give her all that you have? Be careful. That's a question that could poison your life. Your love of beauty could actually kill you. Are you having a breakdown? And the bathroom spins all the way around at a sort of unbearable speed. I stare at the toilet. Answer the question, idiot. Don't just sit there. I can't give the beggar all that I have because I... Because I, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have beliefs. There's a reason why I'm not going to give the beggar all my money. Yes, I'm going to give her some of it. I always give away quite a surprising amount to people who have less than I have. But there's a reason why I'm the one who has the money in the first place, and that's why I'm not going to give it all away. In other words, for God's sake, I worked for that money. I worked hard. I worked hard to make that money, and it's my money because I made it. I made the money, and so I have it, and so I can spend it any way I like. This is the basis for our entire lives. Why can I stay here in this hotel? Because I paid to stay here with my money, and that entitles me to certain things. I'm entitled to stay here. I'm entitled to be served. I'm entitled to expect that certain things will be done. Now, this morning, for instance, the chambermaid left my room a mess. The floor was dirty. There were no clean sheets. The waste paper basket was left full. So, I paid to stay here. I paid to be served. I'm entitled to service. The chambermaid did not serve me properly. That was wrong. And I'm seized by another fit of vomiting. Why is the beggar sick and dying? Why doesn't she have money? Didn't she ever work? You idiot. You pathetic idiot. Of course she was. She worked 16 hours a day in a field, in a factory. The beggar worked, the chambermaid worked, 
You say you work. But why does your work bring you so much money while their work brings them practically nothing? You say you make money. What a wonderful expression. But the question is, how can you make so much money in a single hour while in the same hour they make so little? Heat pours over me and enormous fat water bugs cover the floor, running fast, hundreds of them running in patterns. I stand up to avoid them and a tall soldier approaches me. He's a soldier of the army of that revolutionary country I visited. Yes, he's some sort of a revolutionary guard. He's dressed in a t-shirt and he's lifting his leg. He's lifting his leg and then he twirls around and he kicks me in the face and I fall backward onto a bunk, a hard bunk and I, I'm in a cell. And the guard reaches into a big bag and he pulls out a slim little paperback and it looks vaguely familiar. And he throws it at me and he leaves the cell. Read it, he says. Read it. Read it. And I run to the door of the cell and I scream, what are you doing? But he's gone away. I scream and scream until my throat aches. But now I'm alone with an ugly little book. My hands drip with sweat as I sit on the bunk and start to read. It's just exactly what I expected it to be. <coughs> the story of my life from the outside only. All the most tedious questions answered in full. As if a person's life were a customs form. Chapter one. What country I grew up in. What city, what street, my family's origins, the color of their skin, how much money they made, what I was fed, what I was taught. Chapter two. Now this is unbelievable. This is what they've actually printed in a book about me. Wash his hair every day unless in a hurry, quote unquote. When meeting friends for dinner or going to the theater, takes a bath in the late afternoon, puts on fresh clothes. What in the world is going on? This has absolutely nothing to do with what I am like, with anything at all that's important about me. The book says nothing about the works of literature that have changed my life, nothing about my most deeply held convictions, and yet it describes how often I wash my hair. Don't they know that everything that they say about me in this book is just as true of, of, of my neighbor, Jean, as it is of me? My neighbor, Jean, who is the exact opposite of me. My neighbor Jean, who makes funny remarks about starving children in Asia, who boasts about fucking colleagues at the office on the boardroom table. Don't they know that? One of the guards holds my arm behind my back. The other one starts hitting me in the face with his fists. He hits me in the face several times, then in the chest, then in the stomach. No one in my life has ever hit me before. I'm thinking about the damage each blow might do and a little bit of blood is coming out of my mouth. And there's another guard, a woman whose face is like a cave that's been soaked in rage. And she's standing to the side and my cries are echoing in the cell, no, no. And then she comes up to me and she spits in my face. And I'm screaming out at her, for God's sake, what have I done to make you feel like this? What in the world have I done to you? When the guards leave, I cry like an animal. Boy. I can't stop thinking about my mother, the way she took care of me. I can't stand this. I collect myself, get a grip on myself. I have to survive. And so I sit on my bunk, pick up a little book, and cry and read and cry and read. And time passes, so much time, it seems like forever. And then yes, yes. All right, I see it. I see that there's an answer to the question I asked. How can you make so much money in a single hour while in the same hour they make so little? It's not that complicated. Of course it could have been predicted from knowing the things in this book, where I was born, how I was raised, what an hour of my labor would probably be worth today. Even though to me, from the inside, my life always felt like a story that was just unfolding, in which nothing could have been predicted. But yes, the moment I was born, a piece of land was given to me from which rich fruit could be plucked by eager hand. And I was taught to be very eager. And the food I ate made me healthy. And the education they gave me led me step by step to a job and an office. 
an office equipped with clever technology, not invented by me. And of course, you can do so many things in a cleverly equipped office because sitting alone in an office like that, it's so easy to tell people in different rooms or different countries what you want them to do. And depending on what job you have, you can tell them to make a thousand hamburgers, turn down the sheets in a thousand hotel rooms, film a thousand amusing scenes and delightful comedies for television. With the result that in a single hour, you can make a lot of things happen. And each one of those things will give some person out in the world some benefit for which they'll pay money. And some of that money will come back to you, which is why you can make so much of it in a single hour. The beggar, the chambermaid, Sure, they were given some land, but it was barren, uncultivable. And they were never taught to be eager. And the food they ate didn't make them healthy, and they were never given a job with a cleverly equipped office. And the book tells what I do at work every day. And obviously somewhere there's a book about each person in the world which tells what they do every day. And of course, if you think about any particular day, you can use these books to make a list of all the things that people did in the world on that day. And the remarkable fact is that that list will always be incredibly short. If, if you made a list of all the things that people did in the world yesterday, for example, there'd be no mention of anyone who came to my hotel room to fix my sink. No one did that. The hotel employs a worker who might have done it, but the owner told him to do other things. And so he did the things he was told to do by the person who paid him. He didn't do the thing I would have liked him to do. He didn't do the things he might have wanted to do. He did the things he was paid to do. And so, of all the things that might have been done in the world, the ones that were paid for were the ones that were actually done. Which means that the holders of money determine what happens in the world. They bid their money in the marketplace for the things they want. And each bit of money determines some fraction of the day's activities. So. People who have a little money determine a little. People who have a lot of money determine a lot. And people who have no money determine nothing. And then the world obeys the instructions of the money to the extent of its rather small capacity. It does a few things, not more. And then it stops. It's done what it can. The day is over. Certain things happen. If money was bid for jewelry, there was silver that was bent into the shape of a ring. If it was bid for operas, there were costumes that were sewn and chandeliers that were hung on invisible threads. And there's an amazing moment. Each day, before the day starts, before the marketplace opens, before the bidding begins, there's a moment of confusion. The money is silent. It hasn't yet spoken. Its decisions are withheld, poised, perched, ready. Everyone knows the world will not do everything today. If food is put on trucks and delivered to groups of hungry children, then certain operas will not be performed. If certain performances are in fact given, the food won't be put on trucks and the children will die. I pull myself over to the window. It doesn't have bars and I stick my head out. I'm crying, I guess, but it feels rather pleasant because of the warm wind. But I suddenly feel the presence of someone behind me, <coughs> sitting on my bunk, smoking quietly. Wait, it's that guard who spat in my face. And so I can't help impulsively sitting down beside her and trying to explain myself. Look, I say to her, I'm a human being. Well, of course I want to have a good job and make a good wage. What do you think a human being is? A human being happens to be an unprotected little wriggling creature, a little raw creature without a shell or a hide or even any fur, just thrown out onto the earth like an eye that's been pulled from its socket or a shucked oyster that's trying to crawl along the ground. We need to build our own shelves. Yes, shoes, chairs, walls, floors, and for God's sake, yes, a little relief, a little consolation, because Jesus Christ, you know, you know, we wanted our lives to be happy. We wanted our lives to be absolutely great. We were looking forward for so long to some wonderful night in some wonderful hotel, some... Wonderful breakfast set out on a tray. We were looking forward like panting dogs slobbering on our rugs. How we would delight the ones we loved with our kisses in bed. How we would delight our parents with our great accomplishments. How we would delight our children with toys and surprises. 
But it was all wrong. It was never right. The hotel, the breakfast, what happened in bed, our parents, our children. So, yes, we need relief. We need consolation. We need nice clothes. We need nice things to wear. We, we, we need beautiful paintings. We need plays, movies, drives in the country, bottles of wine. There was never enough relief. There was never enough consolation. I'm doing my best to be a good person each day of my life. I try to be nice. I try to be lighthearted, entertaining, funny. I make Jokes to the janitor every single morning, to the parking lot attendant every single morning. I try to be as amusing as I can be to help my friends get through the day. I write little notes to people I like when I enjoy their articles that they've written or their performances in the theater. When a group of people at a party were making unpleasant comments about the advertising business, I steered the conversation to a different topic because I knew my friend Monica was starting to feel uncomfortable because her father works in the advertising business. The bunk is empty, except for the book. But the pages of the book fill with blood as I pick it up, soaking my clothes, spilling over the floor. There's still the preface. Everything that happened before I was born. The voluptuous field that was given to me. How did I come to be given that one and not the one that was uncultivable? Yes. It happened that way because before I was born, the fields had already been distributed, apportioned. Not by chance, not by fate. The fields were taken and pieced together, one by one, by thieves, by killers. Over years, over centuries, night after night, knives glittering, throats cut again and again, until a beautiful Christmas morning we woke up and our proud parents showed us the gorgeous, shining, blood-soaked fields which now were ours. For so many generations, our ancestors had told their children, this is what we're giving you. Now, you should give your own children the next hillside, the next valley. From each advantage, draw up more. The people in the next valley will always fall back, retreat. Give you what you want, or sell you what you want for the price you want. They have no choice because they're sick and weak. They become the poor. And then, just a few generations back, our ancestors finally declared, the time of apportionment is now over. We have what we need, our position well defended from every side. Now finally, everything can be frozen just as it is. The violence can stop. From now on, no more stealing, no more killing. From this moment, in eternal silence, the rule of law. So that was the preface. Yes, it's terrific. We have everything. But there's one difficulty we just can't overcome. A curse. We can't escape our connection to the poor. We need the poor. Without the poor to do the things that have to be done, get the fruit off the trees, to tend to the excrement under the streets of our cities, to bathe our babies on the day they're born. We couldn't exist. Without the poor to do the awful work, we would spend our lives doing all that awful work. And if the poor were not poor, if everyone who worked were paid the way we're paid, the price of an apple or a shirt would be so high we could barely afford it. But the horror is that wherever we go, we see the poor. And we can never forget the time when they owned the land. We can never forget the death of their families, those vows of revenge that were screamed out in those rooms that were running with gore. And the poor don't forget. They live on their rage. They eat rage. And so, we have to talk to the poor. <coughs> they want things to be different. They want change. And so we say, yes, change. But not violent change, not theft, not revolt, not revenge. Instead, listen to the idea of gradual change. Change that will help you, but that won't hurt us. Here's the contract. We're going to give you wonderful things. But in exchange, you have to accept that you don't have the right to just take what you want. 
We're going to give you wonderful things. We're going to give you much, much more than you're getting now. But there are certain things that have to happen first, and these are the things for which we have to wait. First, we have to make more, and we have to grow more, so more will be available for us to give. Otherwise, if we give you more, we'll have less. When we make more and grow more, we can all have more. Some of the increase can go to you. But the other thing is, once there is more, we have to make sure that morality prevails. Last year we made more and we grew more, but we didn't give you more. All the increase was kept for ourselves. That was wrong. <laughs> the same thing happened the year before and the year before that. We have to convince everyone to accept morality and next year give some of the increase to you. And so we all have to wait. And while we wait, we have to be careful. Because we know the poor. <coughs> we know there are some who are the violent ones. The ones who won't wait. These are the destroyers. And we know exactly what they planned because we've imagined it all a thousand times. That sound at the door, then they break through the lock and run in yelling, pull us up from where we've gathered at our family table having our meal, pull the old parents out from the bathroom, the young or little ones up from their beds, then they line us all up together in the hallway, slap us, kick us, curse us, scream at us, our parents bleeding, our children bleeding, pulling the children's clothes from the closets, the toys from the shelves, ripping the pictures off the walls. What will they do to us, we ask each other. What? Are they giving all the homes to people who now are living in the streets? Then terrible stories. Shops torn apart. Random killings. The old professor given a new job, cleaning toilets in the railroad station. It seems impossible. Can that possibly have happened? A mob of criminals or unemployed louts? People who a year ago were starving in the slums? Are they going to be running the factories now? The schools, everything, the whole country, the whole world? We have to prevent it. Although the violent ones are everywhere already, teaching the poor that the way things are is not God-given, that the world could be run for their benefit. And so we have to set up a special classroom for the poor, to teach the poor some bloody lessons from the past, shove the lessons of history down their throat, we have to teach the poor that they must never try to seize power for themselves because the rule of the poor will always be incompetence and it will always be cruel. The poor are bloodthirsty, uneducated. They don't have the skills. For their own sake, it must never happen. And they have to understand that the dreamers, the idealists, the ones who say that they love the poor will all become violent, crazed, power-crazed brutes at the end. And the ones who claim they can create something better will always end up by creating something worse. The poor must understand these essential lessons, chapters from history. And if they don't understand them, they must all be taken out and shot. We can't accept violence against the symbols of law, the soldiers and the police. If those symbols are attacked, the attackers will have to be killed. But if the struggle goes on for a long time, then the ones whose older sisters and brothers we've already killed may be so full of rage that they don't fear death. And to control those people, we may have to go farther. Cut out their tongues, cut up their faces, force them to watch us torture their parents, watch the soldiers rape their children. It's the only way to control people who don't fear death. And so we'll teach the poor that yes, yes, we're going to give them things, but we'll decide how much and when because we're not going to give them everything. Water bugs still cover the floor, but I brush a few aside and I lie down among them. And it's as if a voice like vomit is coming up slowly in my throat. Stop! Everyone has always been so good to me. No, listen. I want to tell you something. You've misinterpreted everything. The old woman who worked in the bakery who bent down and gave you sugar-covered buns did not love you. You were not loved the way you thought. But of course I still feel an affection for myself. Someone so happy, cute, funny? No. <laughs> That's not what you are. You're not that. Why do you think that they all love you? What do you think they would love about you? 
What are you? There's no charm in you. Nothing graceful, nothing that yields. You're simply a relentless, unbearable fanatic. Yes. The commander who crawls all night through the mud is much less of a fanatic than you. Look at yourself, look. You walk so stiffly into your kitchen each morning. You approach your cupboard. You open it. You reach for the coffee. The coffee you expect to find on its shelf. And it has to be there. And if it isn't, oh, the hysteria. The entire world will have to pay. Listen to your voice on the telephone. Listen to the tone that comes into your voice when you talk to one of your very good friends and you talk about your life and you use those expressions. What I need to live on. The amount I need just in order to live. Are you cute then? Are you funny then? That hollow tone, the amount I need. Solemn, quiet, no histrionics. The tone of hysteria, the tone of the fanatic. Of course, makes sense. You understand your situation. Without a place to live, without clothes, without money. You would be like them. You would be them. You would be what they are. You would be the homeless. You would be the comfortless. So of course you know it. You will do anything. There are no limits to what you will do. Without the money, your face would become the face of a rat. Your hands would be paws, sharp, nimble, ready to scratch, ready to tear. Sure, sometimes you think about the suffering of the poor. Lying in your bed, you feel a sympathy. You whisper to your pillow some words of hope. Soon, you will all have medicine for your children. Soon a home. The heartless world, the heartless people like my neighbor Jean will soon give way. And gradual change will happen. Just the way it happened in... Just the way it happened in... In Holland, in the 19th century. But during this period of waiting, waiting, this endless waiting for gradual change, one by one they come knocking at your door. And they cry out, they beg you for help, and you say, get them away from me. I can't stand this constant knocking at the door. These people who come with these ridiculous stories, who claim to be my sister, who claim to be my brother, all day long, day after day. And so all these people are taken away to bad neighborhoods, where they're toyed with, they're played with. They're lectured, mocked, harassed, humiliated, arrested, beaten, until a few of them do things that are so vicious that everyone who hears about them is filled with horror. And then those vicious people are tied down to gurneys with leather straps and catheters are inserted into their arms and they're paralyzed and they're executed. And the one they're being executed for is you. Just as it was always you that all those people were talking about so many years ago when they kept on saying, for our children's sake, we have to do it. We have to set this town on fire, this barn, this hospital, these forests, these animals, this store of rice, this store of honey. Just as it's still you because of how much you love those clean white sheets and the music and the dancers and the telephone calls from all those people with radiant faces are being tortured tonight, are dying tonight. Do you remember that day at school when you were playing with those three other friends and the teacher appeared in the room with four little cakes and he gave all the cakes, all four of the cakes to that little boy called Arthur and none to you or your two other friends? But first, all four of you were simply stunned. For that first moment, all four of you knew that what had happened was unjust, insane. But then your friend Ella tried to make a little joke. And Arthur got furious and he hit Ella and he went into a corner and he ate all the cakes. He was an example of someone getting away with something. And your life is another example. It's a life of someone who's gotten away with something. And yet your fanaticism is so extreme that you won't let that thought come into your mind. Well, certain points of our universe are simply fixed. The coffee has to be there on the shelf, and no thoughts may come into your mind if it conflicts with the assumption that you are a decent person. <coughs> and so, obviously, during the course of a day, you think about so many things. You think about your health, about all sorts of other people, the ones who treat you badly. You think about the complicated ways in which you mistreat yourself. You think about those children afflicted with incurable diseases who are interviewed in that article you read. You think about all the things you've done that are decent, that show that you're decent, that show that those who are like you are decent, your friends, your loved ones, and all those people all over the world in every country who remind you of yourself. People of goodwill, who have a little money, 
but believe sincerely in a better life for all. You think of all the things you've done that were kind. Think about the kindness of all of your intentions. And if something that you did turned out badly, you think about the good motive behind the action. But if a thought occurs to you that conflicts with the assumption that you are a decent person, that thought is expelled from your brain as automatically and instantly as a homeless drunk wandering in from the streets is expelled from a fancy restaurant. You don't spend time with people who don't think you're decent. You don't read books or articles by writers who don't understand the fundamental truth that you are a decent person. Now, a decent person cannot be a person who's gotten away with something. A decent person cannot have what is not appropriate for them to have. And so, you can look out at the way the world works and, sure, there are many, many things that of course disturb you. The situation of your friend Newt, who's been underpaid for years by his publishing house, or the cruelty of that overseer on that rubber plantation in southern Malaysia, whom you saw in that documentary on television. But still, you can say that the way the world works is fundamentally not unjust, because you've received a share of things which you know it's appropriate for you to have. And if it's appropriate for you to have, have the share of things, that in fact you have. And it's appropriate for those who are like you all over the world to have the share that they have. That means it's not inappropriate for all the others to have the share that remains. You know that what you have is what you deserve. That means that what they have is what they deserve. They have what's appropriate for them to have. And really, if you think about it, it's not so unfitting that the chambermaid should live in hell. Because to you, she really seems like a creature from hell. She spends her life wallowing in dirt, doing sickening, disgusting things. So, can you picture her coming home from work to a lovely apartment in a delightful neighborhood? No, you can't. It's appropriate for the chambermaid to go home at night to that particular room in that particular street, just as it's appropriate for you and your friends to spend your life deciding which products you'd like to buy and upholding high standards of performance and art. The way the world works is fundamentally not unjust. So, the people who want to preserve it are basically good. And the ones who want to tear it apart, the destroyers, are basically bad. You. Because of your intelligent comments on current films. And the thoughtful notes you wrote to your mother's aunt. And how upset you were when the cook in that seafood place brought out to your table the living lobster he was going to boil in the kitchen for your dinner? You have to be defined as the most highest and most admirable type of human being. While the guerrilla fighter in a bright yellow shirt whom you met in that cafe, who out of some desperate devotion to the people she loves, offers up her body to the torturer's knife, can only be defined as the lowest and most reprehensible type, one who deserves the punishment of death. I'm floating in space, holding onto a thick iron bar. Far below me, there's a forest, heat rising up. My hands are so wet, they can hardly keep their grip on the forest. I'm terrified on the bar. I'm, I'm terrified of falling. But a voice says, let go of the bar. You won't be hurt. You'll fall safely into the beautiful forest. I let go, drift through space. I keep thinking I should have landed by now, but I'm still falling. A few twigs scratch my cheeks almost gently as I fall. I fall so slowly, the forest held in a vivid silence. Now the bathroom floor, the candle flickering. I lift it up off the floor. I get up, I walk out of the bathroom. Now I'm back in the bedroom, leaning against the wall. Put the candle down on a little table. <clears throat> a breeze comes in from the open window. I draw a chair to the window and I sit. In the street, far away, a man cries out. The earth relaxes. The prisoner in the execution chamber has suffered and died, and the guards have carried him out to his grave. And yes, there, there's a wash of blue on the dark wall of the sky. A hint of dawn. It's the coolest hour of the 24. I look out the window, and in the cool breeze, 
I remember that I once was a child in a beautiful city surrounded by hope. And I feel such joy, the coolness of the breeze. I wonder if I could put down just for a moment my burden of lies, of lying. Just put it right down on the floor beside me. I wonder what that would be like, just for a single moment while the breeze blows in because I feel so joyful, crazy, naked, free. I want no restrictions on me at all. Dear God, every muscle in my body aches with the effort of constant lying. I'm twisted, contorted, lying from the minute I get up each day till the minute I go to bed. And even when I'm asleep, I think I'm lying. I can't stop because the truth is everywhere. It's in plain sight. Listen to me, my darling. Just. Let it happen. Just for this moment, just for tonight. And tomorrow we'll go back to lying again as if it never happened. We'll forget that it happened. We'll pretend it never happened. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Say it. The life I live is irredeemably corrupt. It has no justification. I keep thinking there is a justification, that I've written it down on some little piece of paper, right? that I can't remember what's on the paper, but it's sitting in the drawer of some desk somewhere. But I'll never find that piece of paper because it doesn't exist. There is no piece of paper that could possibly undo the reality of the blood that was shed so that I could live the way I live. There is no piece of paper that could possibly give a good reason for what the beggar has and what I have. Standing naked beside the beggar, there's no superiority visible in me. I don't actually deserve to have a thousand times more than the beggar has. I don't deserve to have two crusts of bread, of bread more. In all the places like where people like me are in charge, nothing is changing in the life of the poor. poor. There is no change. Gradual change is not changing the life of the poor. That was only something we talked about. My feeling in my heart of sympathy for the poor does not change the life of the poor. Parents who raise their children with good values don't change the life of the poor. And artists who create works of art that inspire sympathy and good values don't change the life of the poor. The chambermaid's condition is not temporary. A life sentence has been passed on her. She's going to clean my room during the day and sleep in a filthy hotel, filthy slum at night. Not She's going, to, she's going to clean my room today, and I'm going to clean her room tomorrow, or I'm going to clean her room next year. Not, she's going to sleep in the slum tonight, and I'm going to sleep in the slum tomorrow night or some other night. No. The sentence says, says that the pattern won't change until the day she dies. But there's a strange fact. Although the terms of existence of the chambermaid were settled at her birth, the terms of my existence were not settled at mine. I say, it's not my fault I have a better chance of life than the chambermaid. It's not my fault I have a little money and she doesn't. But I don't have the money the way I have two feet. The money's not a part of me. Having the money is not a characteristic of mine like the shape of my head. Through a series of events, the money came to me, but devoting my life to defending my possession of something that came to me is not an inescapable destiny. Keeping the money is just a choice I'm making. It's a choice I'm making every day. I could perfectly well put an end to the whole exhausting battle. If people are starving, give them food. If I have more than others, share what I have until I have no more than they do. Live simply. Then bit by bit, a little more simply. Become poor myself. I could certainly do that. And if I don't do it, it's because I've decided not to. And then there's this. My friends and I were never well-meaning and kind. The people who look like sadists were not compassionate scholars trying to do their best for humanity. The burning of fields, the burning of children were not misguided attempts to do good. Cowards who stand around in lecture halls or in the halls of state denouncing the vicious actions of the criminals and the rebels, the muggers and the terrorists, are not as admirable as the teachers, the nurses, the servants of the poor who help people learn how to read, who feed the hungry and comfort the sick. And I've always known that just as every coat and sweater and every cup of coffee contains a story, 
Each vis vicious action of a mugger and a terrorist does as well. And I've always known that my life of refusing to listen to those stories is not as admirable as the stories, the lives of those who allow those stories to come into them and hurt them and change them. I've always loved people who enjoy good meals. People who look forward to watching good performances. I've always found it so easy to love people who are happy. But the funny thing is that everyone might be. I've struggled hard to get what I have. But my struggle has always been against others. In fact, I've been struggling against the people who are poor. And from the point of view of all those people, I know I'm the same as my neighbor Jean. I'm exactly the same, and I'm not on their side. And that, too, is the choice I'm making. I could change sides. If I wanted to, I could decide to fight on the side of the poor. But what would that mean? What would I do? Would I make myself look ridiculous? Would I become one of those people who march in the streets? Would I chant slogans? Would I chain myself to a building? Would I perhaps embark on the life of a traitor? Betraying my own people, my family, my friends? Would I walk deliberately into danger? Maybe I could do that. And if I could, if I could risk hardship, risk discomfort, why not suffering, prison, and even? I blow out the candle and swim across the room toward my beautiful bed. Inside my covers, head on the pillow, I swim toward sleep. Next week, home. But what will be home? My own bed, my night table. And on my table, what? Blood, death, a fragment, a piece of a human brain, a severed hand. Let everything filthy, everything vile be by my bed, where once had been my lamp and clock, books, letters, presents for my birthday, and left over from my presents, brightly colored ribbons. What's going to happen? I'm still falling. 